I was just sort of very dunya centric, we'll say. Yeah. And I I couldn't ever quench that first. Mm. I didn't really know what I was doing, and then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna run away. I'm I'm gonna go traveling. And I'd just been to a festival, and there was a mate there who I'd met, and he wanted to go traveling too. So I was like, listen, let's just buy tickets now. No yeah. plan. We just one way tickets to wherever. And he was like, "Yeah, I'm up for it." And I was like, "All right." So we we're a bit impulsive. We bought a one-way ticket to South Korea, and we had like nine months. I started South, South Korea. You started South, that. South, like we planned to go see 18 countries in six months. I ended up traveling for 18 months, and I only saw six countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They had these ideas of things that sounded to me like gin. So one of the guys who's like the head honcho of this Buddhist temple, he described that there's this other creature or these, these other beings. And I was listening to him. I was like, "Go on." He's like, "That live in another dimension." And I was like, "Oh, go on, go on." And he was describing it. He said they were they were one-eyed, so they have one eye, and they have a, a one concave ear on the back of their head and that. And that they had this notion of reincarnation and all this stuff. And he said that we we had um, our destinies were linked, but they were two. We were two different species, and um, that he could communicate with this other. Species and like the way he would describe them, it was just like it, it sounds like the gin. Assalamu alaikum, welcome to another episode of Rerooted. Today I've got you a special guest. I say that every time, but they're all special guests. Yusuf Ponders. Assalamu alaikum, bro. Wa alaikum salam. It's lovely to see you me and him are bros. Right, Bro-ski. Yusuf, um, just tell the audience who you are. Uh, so you have got your own YouTube channel. Ah uh, yes, uh, it's pondering soul, isn't it? It is. Yeah. I think she's changed it to use of ponders. It'll yeah, be a lot I've been better. thinking that. Have, yeah, yeah, inshallah. But then all the I've got, I've just, you know, the the logo and everything. You're involved in a, a group podcast, aren't you? Tell yeah, Thought Adventure that. podcast. Cool. Yeah, so it's um, me and three friends, mm-hmm. and we every couple of weeks it's supposed to be once a fortnight. Um, we pick a question and then we just sort of roll with it and discuss it for about an hour or so, and then start inviting guests on yeah, and mashallah. have a conversation with it for anyone. Really is welcome, Muslim, non-Muslim, etc. So I had a chat with Jake today as well. So he's yep. part of that. So we talked a bit about that. Well, not what I said was what I love about it is you go really deep into the foundations of, the, of things, and which is always needed because you can argue and debate about these little branch branches and the leaves of of an argument, but actually getting to the roots of it is really yeah. important. Ooh, rerooted, roots. rerooted, me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um and you also work for the sapiens institute is that right yeah, yeah i do yeah, yeah so what are you doing with them at the moment uh so i run their lighthouse project mm-hmm. um which is a project that's aiming at helping people that are suffering from doubt so if they're ex-muslims or interested in islam you can book like a one-to-one uh meeting oh, it's private um and we do it on zoom and we've got about seven or eight people doing that with us at the moment so it's um. me jake abdurrahman does one Hamza, Fahad Tazlim, Dr. Uthman Latif, it's another brother called Malik. Uh, so it's, a, it's a nice little gang of us. That's brilliant. And um, and yeah, and people can, it's a free service. They just go to the website, sapiensinstitute.org forward slash lighthouse, and they just fill in the form. And, and it's interesting, actually. Is it, um, it, do you get an umbrella of different sort of types of people that come, or is it the same yeah, sort yeah, yeah. of? Yeah, no, no, no. There's, yeah, there's all types of people. The majority of the people that use the service tend to be male. Yeah. Um, but there, there is maybe like 30% of them are sisters or people interested in Islam. There's reverts. Wow. We've spoke to ex-Muslims. Really? Um, and, yeah, and, and we also help people that are wanting to get into activism. So we've even spoke to sheikhs and um, people that are engaged in dawah already and they're looking for advice or they want to start doing dawah. They're not really quite sure where to begin. And we help them with that. Or, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's, if, even if, um, for example, there's someone in their family that's having doubts and they're, they're not too sure how to handle that or deal with that, they'll get in touch with us and we sort of walk them through the process, give them ideas and things. definitely a service that needs to happen. Yeah, and the plan is, inshallah, we want it to grow. Yeah. And uh, we'd like it to be like a global service at some point, which is the the, the big game. May Allah make it happen. I mean. Yeah, wicked, man. All right, we'll talk about Dawa later. All right, but first, people people might not know who you are. I doubt it. Pretty check out his YouTube channel. We've put it on the link below, but um, but people might not know who, who you are. So we're going to talk about your journey. Like you're not a born Muslim. No, I'm not. No. You're from Eng- the old England, Ye like old. me. Northern England, the old England, Northern. Yeah, yeah proper. So, I'm a southerner. He's northerner. It's a bit. There's a bit of tension. There's a bit of I tension. Can feel it in the room but, already. But because we love each other for the sake of Allah, Alhamdulillah. We uh, 
Oh. So tell us about your journey. What did you believe before you were Muslim? Uh, so I was raised in a Catholic family. Mm -hmm. uh, so my mum's Polish Catholic. My dad's Scottish Catholic. Mm. Um, and they met in the middle in Manchester. And uh, I was raised there as a Catholic. I was baptised, christened. I went to a Catholic school. I was uh, I went to a Polish Sunday school. So I was like pretty embroiled in that. Um, but then dad passed away when I was about nine. As I became a teenager, I sort of left Catholicism. We didn't really go to church anymore. Definitely didn't go to Sunday when school. you say we, was that the whole family stuff? Yeah, well, there was only me, my brother, my sister mm. and my mum. Okay. Um, really in Manchester. Yeah. But my dad's family are all in Glasgow. Yeah. And my mums were in Poland, but many of them have come here more recently. Yeah. So they're living around everywhere, pretty much. Oh, wow. So they were quite practising before... Like uh, yeah, the elder going. family were so, like yeah. my grandma. Um, you know, they they would always have pictures of uh, John Paul II because he was a Polish pope. Okay, and uh, so Is they that what it was. Yeah, yeah oh, so wow. they, they loved the fact that he was Polish. Um, so there was loads of pictures of him all over the walls, and if you went into the corridor, they always had um, little, like sort of things that held holy water. Right, and so you would use you'd have holy water in no there. Way. Yeah, yeah. Um, pictures wow. of Mary and her pictures of Jesus. So it was like, they were very much into it. Wow. Yeah. That's really interesting. Cause, uh, personally, I've oh, sorry, personally, I've never met um, like Catholics or been friends with them and stuff. So like the idea of having that in the house and stuff so far fetched for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it was more so the, the elder family. My mum, she wasn't as like into it as the rest of yeah, them. Yeah, she yeah. had her own reasons. We can get into that as well, inshallah. But um, yeah, she was more chilled. And yeah. It, we, like we had like a cross above the doorway and things like that. And, but yeah, it's 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 quite um it's a theme. So a lot of Christian or ex Christians or, um, or Muslims that I talked to that were Christian, that's the theme that the um they didn't really they kind of believed in God, but they didn't really like believe in Christianity as much and things like that. And then the the generation like the mum and dad were a bit more staunch with it, a bit more firm. And then the grandparents were really practicing and so on like that. It seems that like nowadays like um the 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 generation our generation are really like irreligious would you say that yes yeah, you can see that it's tapering off yeah um so like my polish family they came from like the sticks in poland and um there's a pretty interesting story about like their background um there was like a whole war that kicked off obviously mm. and they were in the middle of it every time germany and russia had a fight poland disappeared and um they all sort of lived on farms and my grandma was one of 11 children or thereabouts and uh most of the, there was only one boy the rest of them were girls and um her father so my great granddad um that he had quotas that the soviets expected from them mm. and um he had to give them x amount of food no matter what however much he managed to grow it didn't matter it was wow. just he had to give him a quarter and um he, he hid food because he had quite a large family and the soviets found it and uh, they they took him to prison and then left this family basically without the, the man of the household. And the I think the son was one of the youngest. So it was like 10 women. And then his wife just left to run this farm on their own. And it was crazy little things happened there, basically. But he was sort of starved to death on dirty water and black bread. And then when he came out, he was very sick. And eventually he passed away. And it was sort of... So bad, yeah, but crazy backstory from that. But they lived in Poland and wow. were raised there. And then um, my mum was brought here when she was three years old. Mm. Uh, with her sister. Wow. There's a whole uh, thing about them. But so your mum's quite like, because you were brought here like when you were three. When she, when was, she three. was three. Yeah, yeah, obviously not when you were no, three. No, I was a twinkle. So, you, um, so she, she's pretty English, British. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you met her, you wouldn't really yeah, think yeah. much of it. She can speak fluent Polish, um, but she comes across as English as they come. Oh. Especially now she's married to a Boltoner. There we go. And she's like, on tip five, tip four, with tip baby. <laughs> she's getting uh, a bit northern. That's brilliant. Uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we were on, to the way you were about nine, your dad died, um, and, you, and everyone stopped, like, going to church and stuff. Yeah. So, like, keep on the story from there. Yeah, so uh, my dad... I had an interesting relationship with him. Mm. I was like the eldest. So there's me, my brother, my sister. And uh, I was a bit of a mummy's boy. And my dad was like a proper Glaswegian rough man from uh, the Gorbals, which mm. is like a really rough estate in Glasgow. And he had this huge emphasis on trying to make me a man. 
like he really wanted me to be like you know a protector Aunt. of the family yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and um and so because i was the eldest he always put a lot of emphasis on that like we me and my brother weren't that much younger than each other mm. and uh my brother got a little bike i got a big bike and i couldn't figure out how to ride it because it was too big mm. and he'd get angry and so on and so forth and then when i tried learning on my brother's bike i could i managed to do that on my own because yeah. it was a lot smaller i could manage it um but yeah so me and my dad had a bit of a strange relationship my brother was a bit naughty so he, he got on with my dad quite a lot and then um yeah my, my dad was like i said he was addicted to heroin he was in and out of prison quite a lot and uh so yeah it was quite chaotic i'd say maybe but when he was in it was all over the place and when he was away in prison it was a bit more chilled but uh, my mum would always tell us that he was in the hospital yeah I see. and we'd go visit him and he'd be wearing bibs all right to distinguish the prisoners from the guards yeah and yeah, she'd yeah. say no they've just been playing football oh wow and things like that but yeah it was uh, a crazy thing but yeah so eventually he ended up taking an overdose that killed him and then after that the family just sort of we, we didn't really go church at all anymore and drifted away from religion and I ended up getting into some fights in the Catholic school that I was in related to uh, the, the way people would deal with my dad passing away. Right. And uh, I, my mum ended up moving me away from that to uh, a Church of England school, but they were a lot more secular. There wasn't really much going on with church and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, and so we just sort of became more and more secular. And then I went to a proper secular school in high school where there was no religion at all, basically. We had one RE class, and um, the teacher was that taught that was not very good at dealing with the class. It was a DOS class, yeah, yeah, basically. Every school. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and yeah, and so, like, we were just sort of consuming media that ridiculed religion quite a lot. Right. And so I became very atheistic yeah, as a result yeah. of that, because it was just, whenever you met religious people, it was Jehovah's Witnesses or the, the crazy man that stood on a box in yeah. Manchester City Centre yeah. screaming, you're all going to hell. And and that was religion, yeah, uh, pretty much. I exactly the same experience, bro. Like the the, the most mo like my family were all ag agnostic slash atheist. Um, I was brought up that way. My mum sometimes took me to Sunday school just to, like a free nanny. Yeah, yeah. They, they used to do like a summer school, and it, she she was like well happy. She go still go to work. I did, and that's the only like religion. But even then, it was like they're a bit weird. They're looking after me, but they're a bit weird and stuff. Um, yeah, and the only the only like interaction had with someone that was religious, if they were like knocking on your door and being just socially awkward. Yeah, yeah. And then when you watch TV, Life of Brian and yeah, all that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like comedy, it's all taking the, yeah, it's all taking the pick mm. Mick out of religion. And so it's idiot. It's you're either weird or an idiot if you're religious, and that's mm. the thing. So, so yeah, very similar, man. Yeah. So yeah, to just and now we're sat here as Muslims. I know, on a on a thing. Who'd have thunked it? Yeah. <laughs> Who'd have thought? So, bro, um, you went travelling, didn't you? And that's what what changed things. Uh, or was there more before that? So, there's more before that. So, basically, when I was getting to like 17, 18, I left high school. I dropped out of college a couple of times. And I was working in Pizza Up. And uh, there was a couple of friends that worked there as well. And they were Muslim. Mm. They were back of house, I were front of house. And uh, we used to go Winslow Road or Wimmy Road, Curry Mile, as it's otherwise known. And um, we used to go to these like shisha cafes and stuff and sit down and talk about everything, pretty much. And obviously they were Muslim, so the conversation of Islam ended up popping up. Yeah. And we ended up talking about things like God and one of them gave me a Quran. And really? I started re Yeah, I started reading it. And uh, obviously I read it as an atheist. Yeah, yeah. And so there were certain verses, certain things that kept popping out, which motivated more conversation because we went out quite regular. So what, do, what did before before we carry on? What did you think of Islam before you met these people? Did you know it about it? What, what did you so think about was, Islam? There was a couple of Muslims that was in my high school, and um, one of them was a bit of a controversial chap. But the first thing I'd ever heard of was um, the nine eleven. Mm. So I remember I was in like year seven or something when that kicked off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember coming home and seeing it on the news and thinking like, wow, this is crazy. What's going on? And uh, and so that was like my introduction to Islam. Yeah. It was that on the news. And then going into school and then like seeing the controversy sort of unfold with Muslims in the school and what they, their opinion on it. And yeah, madness. And, um, but, yeah, and I just sort of grew up thinking that, oh yeah, Islam is just another one of these 
crazy religions and just sort of associating it with that so it enforces that idea we had either mental or um yeah, yeah, yeah. or uh, socially awkward so yeah. yeah and you think you look on the tv and w- what do you see of islam is all these bad people doing bad things oh look religion's ruining the world again so yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. just reinforces it doesn't it yeah, yeah exactly so when you're talking to these guys they gave you a quran and you read that so yeah and then, then. so i was speaking to them about it and they, obviously, when you're hearing about it in the news, it's, you, you get this very black and white impression of what Islam is, mm. that there's the Muslims and then there's the Kuffar. And it's like, you know, it, and even um, the games we used to play, Command and Conquer Generals. Yeah, yeah. It was like ELA Underground. And it was, you know, the, the give a little voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, it was like the really evil bad guy character. And even like the units, you had like the... I'm not even going to say the words, but you know what the, the kind of units that they gave you was yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. I remember my my one was Stronghold Crusader. Did you play that one? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was like the um, the Arab ones were like, <laughs> and they yeah. make them sound really evil. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. the um, the English ones or the or the Christian ones are like characteristics and yeah, you can relate yeah, yeah. to. There's light shining behind yeah. them. And that. And got <laughs> angelic and wings yeah, and, and got golden the dark, crowns. Got the dark Arab, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. It's bad, isn't it? It's just these subliminal things, isn't it? Shapes the way you view. Yeah. So, what did you read in that Quran that that sparked up conversation with those mates? Yes, it was just well, general things. So we were going through it, and it was like you know, within Surah Baqarah, I think it just within the beginning, it starts giving a slight reference to things like Qatar and things like that. So we started talking about that, and then there was the the more controversial bits, so mentionings of things like slavery, and uh, you know, multiple wives, uh, you know, the the roles of men and women mm. all of these things get cropping up and um obviously i started having conversations with them about it and uh it was interesting because they would say certain things and then i'd i'd have a reaction and we get to the bottom of it and i didn't really have an explanation as to why i thought xyz was wrong objectively or whatever and um it, it always ended up boiling down to well yeah i have a feeling i have an intuition yeah, the society thinks X, Y, Z about these things. Um, but, you know, when you're just saying these things, it's like, no, no, but that's unreasonable. That's that's irrational. It's like, well, what does it mean to be unreasonable? It means to not give reasons. And all you're really doing is talking about your feelings. Mm. Like, what are your reasons? And it's mm-hmm. like, oh, right, okay. Uh, and then trying to, like, give the reasons turned out to be a lot more difficult than you think it is. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's quite ironic really because you're talking about being reasonable and being rational and you can't really give r- like a rational argument as to why you feel the way you feel other than well yeah it makes sense if i'm raised in this particular world and this is how they generally think about xyz then maybe that might explain why i feel the way i do mm. but it doesn't say any about anything objectively it doesn't yeah. describe right and wrong it's not really you know, anything beyond that reminds me of that saying i can't remember who said it you'll probably remind me because you're smart but someone said um the more you lie like, you lie lie and lie until it becomes the truth i think it was goebbels or something you know from world war Two. yeah it might have been yeah, yeah so so you say a lie enough it becomes the truth and it's the same with our like the society's beliefs it's everyone feels that it, oh, obviously that's true when actually, what, why? Why do you believe that's true? And yeah. they whittle it down. They don't know why. And the reason they it's been it's because it's been drip fed fed through uh, like through media and so on. And, and education, even yeah. like from a very early point, yeah. I have memories of certain things being taught to us in school, and they're really like drilling in a particular narrative into mm. our head. And you just sort of like they talk it like it's normal, and I don't even think they're consciously doing it because they've just sort of been drip fed it themselves. Mm. And um, you just have this slow building up of a particular narrative. And um, yeah, and then before you know it, you are one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just it yeah. sneaks up on you. Yeah, it's, men- it's mental. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, le- continue the journey, bro. Continue the journey. Uh, whereabouts were we? We were. At, you were um, at the Shisha Bar. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah the Shisha yeah. Bar. So, yeah, we were having conversations and uh, it was really interesting because I would say something and they would question me on it. Mm. And it's like, all right, okay, maybe I don't know. And I, I, at that point, I think I was quite a strong, strong atheist or atheist proper, as it's referred to, where I thought that there was no God and that I that was like a knowledge thing that I knew there wasn't a God. Yeah, same. And um, and so like engaging with them made me become more agnostic. And so I didn't hold okay. on to it. That's cool. Yeah, alhamdulillah. And um, they were really nice as well. And th- this is one of the big things um, that stood out was that they wouldn't, like I would say something, 
and th- their reaction wouldn't be like, oh, you Islamophobe, or, oh, you, you know, they were nice. They, they were understanding that I come from a particular background. And so they understood why I thought the way I thought about certain mm-hmm. things. And so they were just chilled and they would let me ask my questions. And if they didn't know the answer, they didn't give me pretend answers. They just said, no, it's a good question. Leave it with me. I can ask a scholar or there's, you know, I can get in touch with the sheikh and we'll find out. And then they would go away and then they would, they would ask a sheikh or they would ask a scholar. Yeah. And then they would come back to me and say, oh, remember last week you asked us this. Yeah. Oh, well, I've went and tried to find some answers and there's the, I got these things here. Yeah, yeah. If you want, we can go over them. And like, yeah, no problem. And it's then we'd brilliant. read them and or talk about them. And then we'd have a, more of a back and forth. And they would always continue that conversation. Um, there was no rush. It wasn't like, you know, that. You, sometimes you get the hard sale dawah. It's like, we need the shahada now. Yeah, come, on, yeah, yeah. come on, come on, come on, come on. Why, 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 yeah. why are you, why are you uh, avoiding it? What, what those brothers were doing is what every Muslim now could do. Yeah, like yeah. If you want to do dawah, that's perfect. It's adab. It's, it's character. Patience. Patience. Sabr, yeah. Uh, patience, mm-hmm. 100%. And um, calm down. Stop getting angry. Yeah. Don't like, be defensive. Don't. Don't. Yeah. Don't be defensive. And be a bit of empathy. If someone says some, if a non-Muslim says something that could be like, oh, that's a bit of offensive to, in your mindset. Chill. Like just let it. Just let it pass. And answer the questions with, with like a um, relaxed tone. And if you don't know, go and find out. It sounds like they're on the ball. That, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Do you know him now? Yes. Yeah, talk to him. Still talk yeah. To yeah. Him. Really. Yeah. 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 One of the sure. brothers, uh, Mel Abessim, he's. Just found out he's gonna have a daughter. Oh my shot. Or uh, a son. I can't. I can't remember now. That's terrible. <laughs> Easy. Both twins. Yeah. But uh, no, they're gonna have a. I think it's a son. Uh, they're gonna have a, a child soon, anyway. And uh, yeah, he's he's an amazing brother. He's um, he helped me out a lot when I started doing dawa. Uh, he helped me with my my laptop and things like that. That's so, brilliant. Yeah, may Allah bless him. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. So they turned you into an agnostic by what did they do? Did they challenge your belief? It was just, yeah, I would ask them questions. I would say, so why is that wrong? Or why do you think X, Y, Z? And yeah. It would be a back and a forth. And then it'd be like, all right. Or like, for example, I would just say evolution. And I, I dropped that on them. Like I knew what it, I was on about because mm. I got taught it in high school. Yeah. Um, and you have that confidence. Like, yeah, well, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. they were like, well, what do you mean by that exactly? And um, I was like, well, you know, things change over time. I was like, well, yeah. So what's the problem? And it's like, well, you know religious people don't believe that so well, you know is that true do, 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 like for example when we talk about adam alayhi salam yeah he was a miraculous creation but if we all come from him how do you explain all the differences between us like you have someone from pakistan someone from england someone from china someone from you know south america they, they all look very different but we all come from the same person so there has to have been some sort of change over time the only thing that we say is that he was not a lesser human or he was not a and you know an animal or something mm-hmm. you know he was he was a miraculous creation yeah. and if god can create all of this why could he not create easy yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's gonna be easy. like creating a human being would be easy if you can create a universe yeah so you know it it doesn't say that things don't change and even if you were to hold for example that everything else changes like you know say evolution occurs with the animal kingdom and the human being was like an exception mm. or it's referred to as adamic exceptionalism um you know there's What's, what's wrong with that? Like, mm. things change, right? But how does any of that in and of itself show that God didn't create a miraculous creature mm. or that he wouldn't be able to? I think a lot of, um, uh, like, atheist agnostics, when they're approaching to have conversation with Muslims, unless they're into the debating scene or whatever, um, they, they um, impose Christian ideas to a Muslim. So they start straw manning almost, like going, well, yeah, you believe the Earth's 10,000 years up? No, we don't. Mm, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, a Muslim, a I'm not a Christian. I know I'm white, yeah, but you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that happens a lot. Or they, yeah. Yeah, um, Another one is when they start, they'll go, oh, but the Quran says the um, you know, the Earth was spread out like a rug. Yeah. And so therefore you think it's flat. It's like, well, why are you saying that? But you're not saying it's made out of cotton or that it's like it's got tassels at the end yeah. or it's yeah, cause my rectangular. Stairs, my stairs are really flat. Oh, that's, yeah, that as well. Yeah, and they're yeah. carpeted. Yeah. You know, or, you know, you believe in a, you know, a stair earth. <laughs> that's got, like, like, why, why do you, do you just take this one attribute yeah. and then just assume that's that? That is what the Muslims believe. And there's a verse in the Quran that refer to things like um, revolving and things. You know, it, it's it, it's not clear cut mm-hmm. in terms of it being flat at all, and it's uh, often a, like a huge oversimplification of the entire discussion. 
and th- having chats with these brothers was something that really sort of elucidated that. That's awesome. It's like it was almost like um, the, the first door opening from the sh- the cages of atheism, like because I, I was the same. I I actively claimed there is no God, like as if it was a knowledge claim, um, and it was actually go into the foundation of my belief like being honest with myself and realizing that I, I don't hold this belief with any evidence or anything it is i had faith yeah I had which faith. is funny because yeah. faith is a dirty exactly. word and it was something i would always ridicule religious people for it's like oh you you have faith you have faith so apparently i did as well so yeah. like but i just the difference between us was that they could recognize where their faith lay yeah and i thought i didn't hold faith whatsoever in anything and it just wasn't true at all. I, I had faith in many things. So was it because of them that you became Muslim? Was it, or is there more to the story? Well, they were a huge part of it, definitely. Uh, so they like exposed me to it. Um, they gave me the Quran. So I read the Quran front to back as an atheist. Um, the first time I read it, it felt like it was shouting at me a lot. Really? Yeah, well, it, well I, was, I was the disbeliever. Yeah, because the yeah you're right. I felt the same because this first um, first couple of chapters talks a lot about um, the the psychology of the unbeliever and mm. stuff like that, and they will not believe we've shut up the um, we've, yeah, we've yeah, closed yeah. the seal and all that sort of stuff. And you and yeah. you're looking at it and you're thinking, is this me that it's talking to here? Yeah, yeah. And then like obviously you're talking to it, and you at the beginning you you get this sort of black and white vibe mm. for, you know but it's from a point of ignorance because when you look at it holistically it's, it's not that at all there's you, layers to did you read it to it refute it uh, or did you just read it because of an interest i was just reading it because my friends are muslim and they were talking about it yeah, I, yeah. I, I can't it was that long ago now so that would have been when i was about 17 so yeah. maybe 15 oh, wow. years ago yeah and uh a lot has changed since yeah, there's yeah. many things that have happened um so I can't remember 100%. I just That's remember right. feeling attacked when reading it and yeah. then getting a bit annoyed here and there. And um, certain verses just sort of uh, disappeared into the peripheral. And I didn't really notice or pay too much attention to them. And there were certain verses that like popped and like they really took a hold of my uh, focus, we'll say. Mm. And so I concentrate on them um, and read them or talk about them with them. Uh, that is my friends. And... Um, yeah, it was just a whole completely different experience to what happened later when I became more agnostic. I read it again, and then it was like a different book. Different verses shone out to me. that I, I was like, I've, I have read this before. I don't know why I didn't notice that. Um, and other verses sort of faded away or weren't as um, impactful. And and then again, reading it as a believer, uh, many years later when I took Shahada, it was, every time I read it, it's like a completely different book. It's, it's like a living thing that mm. changes it's as, crazy, uh, it? as you read it know. depending on your own state and your own being yeah yeah it's quite what you what you yeah what you're looking for at the time as well when you're reading things really pop out yeah i mean it's, it's amazing it's every every ramadan i try and that's the most obviously that's the most when i read the translation mm-hmm. i try and read it there uh, regularly but um but ramadan I'm, I'm on it and every time it's like i'm reading a different book yeah yeah it's crazy uh, and every, like i don't know even know how many times i've read it now but when like i try i do the same i try to read it every ramadan i try to do a juz a day yeah i remember yeah. and um and then the, i'll read a verse and i'm like i must have read this a few times now and i don't know why it's only just it feels like a new verse it's, yeah subhanallah it's weird like it's just been snuck in there yeah, somehow yeah, but yeah. It, it's not it's the same quran yeah every time i read it mm. i get that when i read a big chunks of it yeah it's always relevant to something that's going on in life as well it's like, sub- which i yeah. guess is what's making it stand out more than must others. be the subconscious picking it out mm. picking those bits out like when we, i first read the quran uh, kind of to, to re- refute it not refute it in the way that we know now of like i'm gonna get online and yeah, do that, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was like and refuted yeah because it was more like yeah i'm ticking that off as false like that sort yeah, of thing yeah, yeah. and yeah because i was in that mindset of i'm not the muslim i'm the bad guy so, so to speak when at the beginning when they're talking about the um, disbeliever and stuff it's like oh do muslims think of me this way you know yeah, yeah. stuff and and then completely ignore the ver- other verses that are that would look kindly on me because yeah, yeah. it's not what my narrative is at the moment. So it's, it's, it's crazy you, when you read the Quran, you'll, you'll get what you put into it. Well, it's, it's like, um, is it a hadith? It says, uh, Allah is what you think of him. Okay. So if you I think of that. him as unmerciful, he'll be, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Be. yeah. And if you think, if you see him as a merciful being, he'll be merciful towards yeah. you. That kind of thing. That's what you get, mate. That's what yeah, you get. Yeah, yeah, I think it must be that, like, because I'm always thinking, why, what, what did I do to deserve to be like guided? 
and it's like I always really deeply think about that. Like, what what have I? Because I was horrible. I was like, yeah, we all like, were. yeah. When I was like younger and stuff, and I was like, well, why why did Allah guide me? It might have been those little moments where um, I looked at the, his book. It was like, oh, okay, that's cool. Or you know, when when I was looking at like. With open heart, yeah. yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the bits where it's open, Allah opened up things for me. So, Allah, Subhanallah. So, this podcast is becoming about me now. <laughs> I'm interviewing Ben. Yeah. So go on. So go ask, on, Ben. Tell me, me more about yourself. Where well, you? when I was seven, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I will tell you a story. So, oh. you know, we are talking about. Uh, we're just going off on a tangent now. But when you know, we talk about atheists that kind of choose to believe in, um, in like affirming there's no god and stuff a lot of the time when you talk to atheists they are atheists for uh, or they're or they're anti-religious for emotional reasons yeah Hmm. and i remember one reason uh, and it's recently actually because i was around my mum's we were talking about my granddad my granddad died when i was seven yeah and i remember at that time i was i was a bit skeptical about um uh, supernatural things, but there could be things. I, I didn't believe in Santa anymore and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, my mum said, "Well, I want write a, write a letter to Granddad. We'll pop it in his pocket and bury him, and that, and you know, it'll be a personal thing for you." Oh, that's lovely. I didn't go. Oh, I'm going to miss you, Granddad. I went right when you got well, right. Can you come and visit me as a ghost? <laughs> Do you guys say that? Uh, I literally said, "I was like, I really want to know." Like, uh, I'm good. I did say I would miss you and stuff, but I was like, um, "Please, like, this is my communication with you now. If you, if you, if there's an afterlife, can you come and show me?" And so, obviously, no, the ghost, didn't, ghost Granddad didn't visit me, so it kind of affirmed that at that point emotionally that there's nothing supernatural, and it was just like my whims and desires. I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, "Wow, I was that. Yeah, I was seven. I think." seven or eight and i was that young and that's the start of the atheist journey you know? well it's, it's funny you know because like for me when my dad passed away that was also round about the same time that you start learning as well that there's no such thing as santa yeah yeah there's no such thing as the easter bunny there's no such thing as the tooth fairy and um when my dad was alive we were sort of sheltered and we were told a, a particular narrative even about what my dad was so I mentioned he was on heroin. Mm. I remember watching my dad take heroin. He would do, like he's uh, in and it's the house. My mum's still in now. So he would sit in the bathroom and he would be on the toilet and he would have tin foil and he would ask us to save our Kit Kat foil. You know the wow for for himself. And we always used to do that. And he said it was for his medicine. And so there's this narrative painted that this was medicine yeah, and that yeah. he, he was ill. And even when he went to prison, it was a hospital. Yeah, yeah. And so they painted this sort of like fairy tale around my dad. And my dad obviously was a huge part of that fairy tale. And the, like, I have memories of it. And I, I remember watching him burning the the heroin and seeing it and then watching the fumes. And he used to take the Bic pens mm. and he used to toot the, the fumes. Yeah, in yeah. Front. And me and my brother would be making potions in the sink. Or like just messing about, yeah, and we were yeah. there. And um, I remember Makes finding panel, needles wow. and in the house and stuff like that. Wow. And uh, and visiting him in prison. And then when he passed away, it was like what killed him? Yeah. It, well, it was heroin. It's like what? What do you mean? And then this uh, fairy tale oh, crashed. Yeah. So All the veil was taken. Yeah, over. yeah, yeah. Like and reality was there. And yeah. when we were younger, we used to, like there was um, moments when we would find out one of the neighbors was a, a heroin addict. And so me and my brother or me and my friends would come back and we would be like, oh, he's a junkie or that kid's dad's a junkie and blah, 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 blah. And then I remember my mum would tell us off and say, you don't, don't say that. And obviously she knew because my dad was a junkie. Mm. And um, obviously it's not a nice word to use, but it's the one we were using. And um, so she would like, without telling us, say, you shouldn't do that. And then obviously all the pieces started to click when my dad passed away. It's like, oh my God. I am the son of a junkie. Yeah. And um yeah, like it, it, it was it was a weird experience because that's um when I I guess I started becoming more and more skeptical of things. It's like I can't what I can't believe anything. Yeah. Like what what do you believe? There's no such thing as Santa. What do you mean the fairy uh, the two fairy doesn't put a pound under my pillow? And obviously you start growing up and becoming more quote unquote adult. And uh we didn't really have any re- um, real authority figures. So it was me and my brother. My sister was born three days after my dad died. And um, wow. yeah, so 
And so we were sort of like just on our own. My grandma would babysit. My mum was a single mother and yeah. she was always working in restaurants, um, like doing split shifts. So she was always at work. And my grandma was uh, a crazy little Polish woman uh, with paranoid schizophrenia. And <laughs> and her English wasn't very good. And uh, she would spend most of her time being very strange. We've yeah, got some funny yeah. stories about my grandma. But um, she was just an odd character and she wasn't authoritative. She let us do what we want when we wanted. Mm -hmm. So we used to just go out uh, we started smoking. She even would give us tobacco. No way. As children. Wow. So we were like, you know, 12 or something. And um, if we wanted tobacco, she would give it us. And it was just a weird relationship um, with my grandma. But we were quite, like, free kids. We got to do what we wanted. I would save up my dinner money and get alcohol. And there was some of the neighbours would actually go in the shop and buy it for us. Um, even when we were young, because no one really cared on a council yeah, estate. Yeah, yeah, no. it's, it's normal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And... Um, yeah, so, like, we just sort of had that. And then on top of that, we're consuming media, like you mentioned, you know, this sort of anti-religious stuff. Um, you're watching stand-up comedy and they're mocking religious people and that we just absorbed it like a yeah, sponge yeah. and we became that. And it, and your your personal experiences as well kind of reflected th that, those beliefs as well. Yeah. yeah. I think um, we'll go, we'll, let's move on to... Um, so you with, with your specialization is nihilism isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. and it sounds like you had like the, you know that path is nihilism you're going down you, like all the beauty of the world <laughs> dropped uh, all that magic's gone and it's all very real and you're spending all your time consuming intoxicants and stuff you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so well that that was it really we were like um like the people that I hung around, what we generally tend to do is chase girls, drink alcohol, smoke weed, and just like mess about basically, watch funny stuff, yeah, uh, play computer games, and um, it, life just became about that. And so when I started working and things, all my money was just being spent on fancy clothes, earrings that sparkled, aftershave. Yeah. <laughs> um, Did you ever have the tunnels? No, 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 no. Yeah, that was, n I was, I'm too old. That yeah. didn't Why come to much Why are you too old? Later. You're my age. I'm older than you. No, you're not. You're 32. Yeah. yeah. I'm 32. Oh, you're 32 as well? Yeah. Oh, right. I no. stretch my ears. Too old. Cheeky git. Well, maybe you were just more I was just niche. weird. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you were. Yeah. I did it. I, I used to work in a tattoo piercing shop, yeah, and you, eight, eight millimetre was the lo biggest you could stretch. That was a mosher thing though, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we weren't moshers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're we were, were chavs. You were a townie. I did, I did chill with some moshers because I used to do Warhammer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, my Warhammer friends were moshers. Yeah. And uh, I was the chav yeah. that used to be nice to them. Yeah, yeah. And I so couldn't they imagine you was a chav. Me. Yeah, I was proper chav. I used to get patterns in my hair and that. Yeah, yeah. And I used to do it with the cutthroat. <laughs> and uh, I might still have pictures of it, but uh, once every we'll week and a half, yeah, inshallah, inshallah. But once every week and a half, they used to like um, cut throat patterns into my hair, yeah, yeah. and then my skin was always like shredded because it was like a razor sharp it. knife. <laughs> no, no, because they did it for me, but oh, it was right. a sharp knife. Yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. the way they do it, it was like oh, it mate. would just rip my my head to shreds. Wow. But I used to pay fifteen pound every two week wow. to get that done, and then I would wear like. Uh, do you remember when trespass pants were a thing? No, what's that? Trespass pants, ski pants with the dungarees. No. All the chavs used to wear them. Oh, okay. I might have just been a North thing then. Might have been. Yeah, we thing. just we we used to wear trespass pants, which are like pants for skiing, but they had dungarees. Right. But we would get them and then put the dungarees down oh. so they would dangle. We had like, like suede, heads. yeah, suede Timberland boots. Yeah. And uh, you know, TN hats and all of that crap, and it would be like summer. And I'm walking about in bloody skiing pants <laughs> because I thought it looked cool. Because they're cool, yeah, yeah. That kind of rubbish. Yeah, but, um, yeah so like I, I just got very <laughs> absorbed in this uh, materialistic sort of attitude. Laura diminishing returns sort of kicks in. Like the more you're using weed, the more you're drinking, the more you're chasing girls and things like that, the less of an impact it has on you and the more you need to feel something. And um, it was just, I was just, losing touch with it all it was like i was chasing it but it wasn't it was never it was like the um the thirst that you could never quench and it was just it was getting more and more frustrating yeah and i was trying to figure out who i was and how i fit into the world where i wanted to go what i wanted to do and I, you know i was working in call centers and in restaurants or um yeah just trying to figure out who i was exactly because i had this weird mixed um, sort of history 
So my dad was Scottish, mum was Polish. I never really felt English either. So really? like, yeah, 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 which was weird. Could people knew me as someone who was half Polish, half Scottish, and then I would speak to them. I was like, well, why am I? How, why am I 50% Scottish and 50% Polish? Like, oh, well, your dad's from Scotland, isn't it? Why is my dad Scottish? Because he was born in England. Uh, because he was born in Scotland. It's like, well, if my dad's Scottish because he was born in Scotland, why am I not English? Because I was born in England. That's weird, what about, isn't it? what about your mum? Oh, well, my mum was born in Poland, so she's Polish. But then I'm... Fi- and, I've, and not just that, I'm 50% Scottish, 50% Polish. There's no room for any English there. <laughs> so, like, I'm, I've been born and raised in England my whole life. But I'm not English. Really? Yeah. It was, that was quite common. People, like, one of the nicknames I had in high school was Polish. So, what, was it, what must it be like for people who are, like, more physically, like, some of maybe yeah. from a Pakistani background? Where or, they're more visibly yeah, foreign. Yeah. Like, that's, if well, someone that, like, yeah. no, that's weird. We didn't have that in my but there was, school. We didn't have many people that were from other places like, yeah, yeah. the council that i grew up in for example was heavily white a white area and yeah. it was it's not so bad now like there's it's bad. A lot what's of, bad about white no i mean my estate <laughs> joking, plonker. Uh, the, the estate's not as bad as it used to be is yeah, what yeah. i meant to say and um but like back in the day i used to have friends uh their dads were like skinheads yeah they had yeah. ss tattoos and that and <sighs> Mate, it's like halloween that. they used to go to the pub dressed as skinheads with nazi signs on the wow. forehead and no one would say nothing and get their head kicked in. Yeah, they were, now they'd get their head kicked in, but it didn't happen back then. Like it was quite. He, they were the ones doing the head kicking in. No, that's what I mean. They, no one said anything to them. Oh yeah, because they would get their yeah, head. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. And um, <clears throat> so that was just like a normal thing. We used to see that kind of thing all the time. And if people of an ethnic minority ever moved onto your estate, they would generally get bullied off. Yeah. Um, so like there was someone who moved onto our estate. And with straight away, pretty much, people posting fireworks through the doors and putting dog, hey, poo, dog poo on the door handles until eventually they felt threatened and they'd leave. And then at the same time, these council estate people would complain. It's like, oh, all these people, they, they come here and they just all gather together. And it's like, well, they have to because if, you, yeah. if they try to integrate, you bully them up. <laughs> so they all end up moving to the yeah. same estate because oh, they feel mate. safe together. Yeah, of course. It's this, this nasty feedback loop. Yeah, and then yeah. they, like, and then we had this sort of, Right, so there was a there were gangs uh, where I lived, and uh, they had cheesy names: DPH, Jumas Potheads. <laughs> Jumas was the uh, was the the street name of the main road where yeah. our estate was. At. Yeah, yeah. What other gangs were there? Uh, down the road, there was the CLC. Why is they always? Why are they always like? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because on. that was a cool thing, wasn't it? Because it, was, it was easy to graffiti tagging it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So and, what? Um, what they? What that stand for? That standard for cross lane crew. Cross lane crew. Yeah. But, oh yeah, you're northern, aren't you? So you wouldn't yeah, say it. Like yeah. that. And we had um, pe- like a few of my mates were MCs, and they would we'd have street street battles and that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> giggle over there, and uh, I I was not very good at it, so I never bothered. But I, I I enjoyed watching it, and I enjoyed like bigging my friends up that were good at it, and um, yeah, it was just really cheesy, but. <laughs> And one of the estates, can't imagine it. I know, I know. I know. Trapped out of our head as well. So you can imagine me with like patterns in my hair. Yeah, yeah. A, a big <laughs> blingy <laughs> earring. I, honestly, bro. Trespass like, pads. The summer sweat in my back out because it's I, boiling. I, I imagined you as little grunger. I, I mean, a what? A, like a, a um, mosher. You call mosher. I had mosher. For, so yeah, I, I was a bit of a I social ima- chameleon. Yeah. And it was funny as well because, like, you know, I said I, I used to do Warhammer. So I used to have the warm hammer box, yeah, and it used to say Games Workshop on it. And you'd hide it. I'd have to, yeah. man. I had to, like I'd go. We, I used to go to Bolton, so it's like a five two four bus ride, which is a mission mm. away, and uh, it, take, it takes like half an hour or something, forty five minutes to get there on the bus. And then I come back, and if I was walking back home and I was bumping into some of like my scally mates or my chaff mates, mm. uh, they were like, "What's that? What's that?" I'd have to. I was, oh, it's a toolbox. <laughs> The toolbox, yeah, no, no, it's nothing. Yeah, it's just tools. Just had to bring them back from my mate's house, and then I'd have to like try to change the conversation because I was just, it was like I was ashamed of it, yeah, 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 because it was a really geeky thing, geeky yeah. thing, like and uh, moshers and scat, like chalies, uh, chalies, scallies, chavs, uh, they, they were at odds with each other. They, Do you know what? I remember uh, it was year eight, I decided to be, uh, we called them grebos when I was a. Uh, we just talk about our childhood now, and it's not even even about Islam now. But it's fine. We'll, we'll oh, go yeah, back no, to Islam. People get an insight. Into <laughs> so, so year eight, I went right because I was in year set right. So I, come, I mine was a little small town in southern England, mostly white people. 
mostly middle class, but I was working class, yeah. So it wasn't that violent. The most you get, like, it was, there's nothing compared to yours. No dog poo on the handles or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Yeah, so so um, so in year seven, I, I hung out of all the, the Chavi type people. But during the summer holidays, I got really into rock and stuff, and Kerrang Radio. And oh, that. I used to listen yeah. to Kerrang. Yeah. And when I was, I was a bit, of, like I say, a chameleon, so I'd listen yeah. to Kerrang. I used to love, like, System of a Down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this 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 is the journey I went, uh, and then in my teens I went full on punk mohawk. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, but but um, in year seven I decided. So there was um, this there was this um, band called Linkin Park. You probably remember them. And one of them had like s- little twisty like spikes on his hair, mm. blonde ones. I went, I want that. I was like, <laughs> wait a minute, you had curtains yesterday, Ben. You want you want a twisty spiked? It? Yeah, dyed it. My mum, my, why what are you doing, mum? Why are you dying it? Like, are why you, are you like, facilitating this? Yeah, he's facilitating shit. Right, so I dyed my hair blonde spiked it got a big slip not hoodie big baggy trousers with a yeah, chain you'd have got I was, I was, no I, yeah no but yeah, this yeah, was no no not, no you would not have had a good time so what then. happened in year eight because everyone just popped <laughs> up so all these people that were in the chat they just because it started becoming cool so and there was just a big split and then one day there was a big battle like braveheart yeah freedom right and there was just chavs on this side or townies we called them townies is another one and then yeah, grebos yeah. over here which was moshers yeah and 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 it was like we all squared up and it was like gang- have you seen gangs in new york yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like that but without the fight it was just all like yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, the teacher was coming now i'm gonna be larry and then they'll, they'll break it up oh, yeah, yeah, like that and then that was it and i i picked my allegiance and then that was it oh, so cool. yeah anyway back to islam right <laughs> but yeah you're talking about um so we're talking about your childhood because because of the nihilism yeah so like i was just sort of very dunya centric we'll say yeah and i i couldn't ever quench that first Mm. i didn't really know what i was doing where i was going and i was working in call centers things were so repetitive Uh, welcome to you know insert brand name here Mm. you know you're through to sean today can i take your mobile number please thank you very much yes and how can i help you today all of that and um but it was just the same thing over and over and over and over again. And it felt really fake. And I, I, I really um, hate inauthenticity and like these environments were just like inauthentic to the nines. And it was even more annoying because they were trying so hard to be authentic that it like, it just, yeah, it was annoying. It's like they, they recognized that they weren't authentic. It's like, how do we make it look like we are? And that's pretty much what most of the training was. It was like, you know how to trick people into thinking you that you actually care about them yeah. and um i was just getting sick of it i ended up like with a girl and we moved in together and that didn't work out and we broke up and then i was like you know what i'm going to run away i'm i'm going to go travelling and i'd just been to a festival and there was a mate there who i'd met and he wanted to go travelling too so i was like listen let's just buy tickets now we, you know we've got a date and then we have to save up and you've only got until that point yeah that's a good idea and then we go no yeah, plan. Yeah. We just one way ticket to wherever, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm up for it." And I was like, "All right." So we're a bit impulsive. We bought a one way ticket to South Korea, and we had like nine months. I started South, South Korea. You started South, at South Korea. Oh wow! Yeah, that was where we first yeah, went. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then yeah, and then I sold everything that I had. Uh, I sold. I was selling things on eBay for a little bit, and then I was working like twelve hour shifts, doing Christmas Day, getting time and a half, and uh, working every bank holiday and saving up as much as I can. I got about. <laughs> About ten grand. I spent three grand on uh, laser eye surgery. Thought you were going to say your, uh, you know, like hairstyle. No, no, laser eye surgery. I, well, I had really bad eyesight. Wow. I used to have contact lenses, and I was like, yeah. I'm not going travelling, having to pull contact lenses out and touch my yeah, eyes yeah, yeah. constantly every day. So I, I just blasted a bit, big chunk of it on laser eye surgery, and now I have X-ray vision. That's awesome. So I can see into your soul, and uh, alhamdulillah. And then yeah, and then with the seven grand, out, like we planned to go see eighteen countries in six months. And that didn't turn out like that at all. We, we ended up, I ended up traveling for 18 months and I only saw six countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, we went really slow. But I did a lot when I was away. I was in South Korea. I went to stay with um, Buddhist monks in a temple mm. in the middle of the mountains, a place called Gwinza Temple. And uh, we worked on the farms with them and that. And 
we, like they were showing us what they did and how they worshipped. And there was a lot of overlap with Islam. And that was really interesting because th- th- some of them would pray, like the monks that stayed behind and didn't work, they would pray like five times a day. Mm. And they prayed a bit like the Muslims. Really? The only difference was is it was to a huge gold statue of a man that lived 50 years ago. Brilliant. And yeah, 50 years 50 ago? 50 years ago, yeah. It wasn't, well, it was, it was not even that ancient. It was so just like the guy who founded the temple. Oh, wow. So it wasn't Buddha. Well, they, no, Buddha is um, just a word for an enlightened being. So oh, there's okay. thousands of Buddhas. And you have the original Buddha, which was, um, what's yeah, his name? Gautama uh, Siddhartha, <coughs> the Prince Siddhartha. And he was like one of the first Buddhas. Just a giant gold statue of a bloke. That's yeah, it was like 50 Crazy, years ago he died and he was this dude. And, but it was huge. And they had more than just one gold statue. It's like, there's loads of them there. But it was a really interesting, in the middle of nowhere, it was built within this valley. Mm. And it went up. And there was loads of layers to it, and it was really interesting. And we, they were like, "Yeah, you can stay." I was like, "All right." And we just slept in this big hall with like, uh, I don't know, hundreds of people, and everyone sleeping on the floor. And uh, they were like, "You can stay here. You just need to work on the farm, and, and you don't need to worry about anything. We'll feed you, etc." I was like, "Yeah, I can do that." And so we'd work like fourteen-hour days. We'd, we'd be up at six in the morning. We were working till eight, and then we'd come back. We'd get scran, and I was like, "Right, I'm gonna go to bed." And you, you're about to lie down and crash out at about 10. And then all you hear is just, just chaos. And this, it turns out that, no, they don't sleep. They chant really loud mm. from 10 till 3 in the morning. Whoa. It's like, oh, right, well, I'm supposed to sleep here. And they, I'm, and they won't let you sleep because if you do sleep, there's a monk with a stick and he hits you. <laughs> and you to get <laughs> well, up. as a guest. You're not a guest. You're just in a temple. You're supposed to be worshipping or, oh, wow. or meditating or oh, doing wow. stuff. And obviously I'm still non-Muslim at this time. And so me and my mate are trying to sleep because we're knackered. And he keeps just... And it's a a stick that makes a noise. So when they hit you with it, it goes... And it's because of the way that it's made or something. It claps. I I don't know. And uh, and so we're waking up. And what they made you do is repeat the name of one of their Buddhas or one one of uh, someone that they Mm. um, really liked. It was... uh, The word was Guanze Umbozai. And you had to repeat it over and over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, it was chaos because they, they weren't synchronized. So everyone was doing their own things. That guy over there was doing it really quickly. Like, da 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 That guy was, da 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 Someone else was singing it. And it was like, you know, when you go into a playground and it's just... Yeah, and everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> Like, just pure madness everywhere. Yeah. It was like that. And we were knackered. Can I had to, we had to go beg them. We said, listen, we can't do this for five hours work for 14 hours and sleep for two you're like we're gonna die we need at least like we're used to like eight nine hours sleep give us five yeah. we'll meet you halfway like and they they agreed so they would we had to sort of like meditate with them for two hours and then after 12 o'clock they promised not to hit us on the head with a stick so <laughs> so we'd go to sleep and we'd wake up for about we go to sleep at about twelve. Wake up for about five. It, do they? Do, this is so, so far fetched. So these tourists, right? In this context, on their not, co- not their tourists. Context, you were tourists. We, no, we weren't even really we, tourists. We weren't. We were working on the farm. Yeah, and know, there was no. There was no white people there. There was just pure Koreans. Yeah, okay. It wasn't like were a tourist a hot like spot. When you when you like joined the community, <laughs> <laughs> were they like, "Why? What are you doing here?" And you're like, "I, I don't know." They didn't speak English. They just went, "Yep." Yeah. They were you just annual say oh, which is like Korean for hello. Okay, <laughs> and they said other things. And then you went oh oh. There was a couple of them that spoke English. Yeah. One of them was always working at the um, the information desk at the front. Yeah, and she was another monk, and um, we never really saw her because she didn't work on the farms. And then there was another who was the youngest of the monks. He was like at the bottom of the monk hierarchy, and he spoke English. And but we were always quite busy. And monks apparently are just not that talkative. So you're not really having that many conversations. You're busy, like, planting rice, tending to the chili fields and stuff like that. And the, the odd time I did get to have conversations, it was always through that one man, and he would translate for us, but it was very difficult because yeah. his English wasn't I bet you were like... I, I, w- <laughs> I was in this world where, where there was no meaning to anything. I work silly hours for nothing, rinse and repeat. So I'm going to go travel. What are you going to do? I'm just going to go to this place, and, you know, n- it didn't really mean anything. I'm just going to work... <laughs> For that ten hour. <laughs> oh, well, to, mate, to be that, honest, was that how you felt? No, you, uh, to be honest, like because cool, it. Was so I, I'd, I'd I'd been feeling nihilistic before I went traveling. Yeah, and I started getting a bit depressed before I'd left, and it's one of the reasons I went was I was sort of running Escape away from rather it, yeah. than running towards anything. Mm. 
And um, so when I, when I was there, this was like a huge form of escapism. It was like a massive adventure. I was in the middle of nowhere. It was crazy. I don't, I, like we ended up there randomly. Like we were with someone who's like, yeah, I'm going to go visit a temple. And we're like, oh, yeah, we'll join you then. And then we ended up there. Join and the um, yeah, we were just like crazy, a part mate. of this temple now. Yeah. And, but it was only, we were only supposed to be there for a night. And then I was like, I don't want to leave. And they said, yeah, you can stay. Oh, wow. So I was like, all right, I'll stay. And um, and yeah, we were just like doing bits. And I was really like, just like hungry for something. So I was, I was like eating it up. Like give me whatever information you can. I want to know what's going on here. Because you, like this was a community of people that lived in the middle of nowhere. And they, they were Koreans. So they come from like Seoul's, I don't know if you, you've seen South Korea, but it's pretty like modern. Like it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. like Seoul is a crazy place. It's like the home of Samsung, man. It's, yeah, you know, yeah. Samsung is Korean. It's mm. two numbers. Samsung are two numbers in Korean, I think. Okay. And um, yeah, and it was just, it was madness. And what people would do is they would try to escape from city life and they would go and stay in these temples and commit to them and become monks. Mm. And so that you had this, like, the, like people were trying to find meaning here and you could mm. see it that they were experiencing meaning. They were like, you know, they, they, they were having experiences. There was one guy and I told you everyone would like be meditating and so this guy was meditating he, his voice he, he was really loud and it to begin with it really annoyed me and then I started falling in love with his voice and I had to move close to him because uh in all the madness and all the chaos the closer I was to him it was unified yes yeah. and so I ended up really liking him he couldn't speak a word of English but he would get into it and he had the way he sang it was like really it was amazing and so I'd, i used to try to stay near him and then one day i was just like bonding with this guy but it was only like a one-way relationship like he just didn't even know i existed and uh i like while he was in the middle of his little chant i went and like, i tried to like get his attention and i knocked him out of it and he started crying and i felt so guilty i was like oh what have i done and it turns out he was like he was hitting some crazy peaks <laughs> doing whatever he yeah, was doing yeah. and i just completely ruined his high and uh and i was like oh sorry that was awkward and then he cried and i just, and i was like i should right, right, yeah so i shouldn't do that but it, like this was opening me up to this notion of like spirituality and yeah, things like yeah. that because I, when i was meditating i started having these weird experiences too where i would have like i'd see things and like it was the world was becoming less um linear you know, I, this atheistic mindset that I have, I was sort of like leaving it behind. And um, yeah, things were weirder than I thought. And the more I talked to them, like it was like they had these ideas of things that sounded to me like jinn. Mm. So one of the guys who was like the head honcho of this Buddhist temple, uh, he went to sleep. He woke up one day, he could speak Chinese. That's meant or, or he went into a meditation or something and then all yeah. of a sudden he could speak Chinese. And um, he... They, the, he described that there's this other creature or these these other beings, and I was listening to him. I was like, "Go on," and he's like, "That live in another dimension," and I was like, "I'll go, I go on," and he was describing that. He said they were they were one eyed, so they have one eye and they have a, a one concave ear on the back of their head and that, and that they had this notion of reincarnation and all this stuff. And he, and he said that we we had um, our destinies were linked. But they were two. We were two different species, and um, th th he could communicate with this other species. And like the way he would describe them, it was just like it, it sounds like the jinn. Yeah, every every culture and every like religion, tribal religion, all 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 parts of the world have jinn. Mm. Uh, but they're just um, taught, they just got a different name, but all the attributes are the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, and there was so much overlap. Mm. And then it was like. And I was looking, it's like, it, it feels like there's some sort of link here between these religions that goes really far back. But then I was looking, but why worship that big gold statue? And it, th these things would irk me a little bit. Mm. And I remember just thinking like, you know, th this just seems a bit too far. Like, I, I don't know why I, I don't know, it was weird. And th th I did come across some people that would refuse to like engage in directing themselves towards these big gold statues and i found that quite interesting and um yeah, and I, yeah like everywhere i went i was just always comparing everything to like what i'd been learning about islam and things like that and mm. th like the islam was always like, the sort of one of the central I and mean, obviously christianity a little bit because i had a, a huge background in that 
Um, but there was always this sort of cross analysis between what I was discovering with what I had uh, come across in the past and, and trying to figure out, well, what's going on here exactly? Talking about um, being around that sort of, like, I'm not going to use the word extreme, uh, very different religious practices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to just quick li- little story. So in, in my journey, in the middle of my, like from Take a Shada to now, there was a bit where I wasn't practicing. Okay? Yeah. Um, and I went uh, once. I went um, to Germany once, just on holiday. We went to this cathedral because that's where, what tourist things were, were there. And it's identical to the Notre Dame one in France, but it's just in Germany. Um, and I went in. It's a big Catholic um, cathedral. And I just, I just, like you know, I said I didn't have any connections with Catholicism or anything. It just shocked me that there's just sta- It was like an idol house. Yeah. Just statues of the, and then there's women and men on their knees praying to this bloke that died in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Like, what's going on? And I just had this weird feeling in my stomach and my lungs of dread. And when I, I couldn't breathe, it was horrible to see all these people worshiping stone and wood. And um, and it, uh, you walk around and you got all these p- pictures of saints and what and and then I I looked at one saint and I looked him up on Google and and what he does if you pray to him he's really good with getting your wife pregnant so you pray to that one and yeah. it's mental. Well, you say that when I went because like I say my family were Catholic mm. but those were the kind of churches we used to go to there used to be statues of Mary yeah. and Jesus and and funnily enough um, one of the things my mum always used to talk about was her experience because her her story is a bit unique so her mother my grandma the one i said was a bit mental she ended up in an insane asylum my mum's dad got run over by a train when she was a baby uh because he was drunk he went stumbled on a rail track somewhere got run over Mm. so my grandma moved to england with my mum and got married to someone else and then she started losing her mind and he ended up divorcing her and marrying her sister. And my grandma was in the insane asylum and my mum was being raised by her mum's ex-husband and her auntie. And they were very religious. And the the Catholic priest always used to come to the house and stuff like that. And my mum would always ask him questions. And one of the things that she couldn't get her head around uh, was the divinity of Jesus Alayhi salam. and I remember she would always talk to me about this when we were growing up about Jesus isn't God like he's a man he's a prophet but he's not God so it, it was funny because she'd always sort of propagate this Tawheed mm. um, and she came from and she wasn't Muslim by any yeah, means yeah. and you know it's the fitra yeah so the, what my experience with that cathedral is it, it was the beginning of me coming back it reminded me how uh, uh, blessed I was that I'm not do I'm not kneeling to these things yeah, yeah, and yeah. and that how wrong it was what they were doing. So I was. And that's ma- what she always reiter- reiterated as well. Yeah. She's like, why are we like who's this guy? Yeah. Like, uh, how do you know this? This is what Jesus looked like at yeah. all. And like, if you're not sure, like, if we got his family album, uh, no, like, we have no idea yeah. what Jesus Alex and I'm looked like. So why are we building these statues? Like, we've got all these pictures of Mary. And these statues of Mary, and then next man, you know, this saint, that saint. Um, uh, when I was going traveling, one of my aunties, she gave me um, a card, which was Saint Christopher or something, I can't remember, the patron saint of traveling. Mm. And she was like, He'll protect you. Yeah. You know, just make a little prayer to Saint Christopher and he'll look after it's you. And it's like, yeah, the, I think the, these things is what reminded me um, of, of the importance of Tawheed, reminded me. Um, and it's, it was one of those nudges to come back to the Dean. That's when I started drifting back, alhamdulillah. Firm now, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. But right, so you're traveling. You're in a Buddhist monk uh, place, but we're talking about nihilism and you and this yeah. reawakening of a remi- remembering Islam during this. So <clears throat> the nihilism came after it, didn't it? Well, the nihilism started creeping in way before. Yeah, it was like life was just felt so empty and hollow. I just realised that a, a lot of some some of the audience members might not know what you mean by nihilism. It's not a day to day thing. People yeah, say, yeah. It? nihilism so just means um, the exp- it, it comes from the Greek nihil, which just means nothing. So it's nothingism, mm-hmm. um, and it's sort of related to the you know the the negation of meaning. So that life has no meaning, life has no purpose, everything's yep. pointless. That kind of attitude. 
it's very pessimistic, very hopeless. And um, so I was sort of really feeling like that. And a good example of it, you know when, you're a gamer, right? Or used to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you ever play, like I used to really love games like Morrowind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah? and um, I used game. to, I used to power some serious time into them, man. Like if I'd have done that in real life, Maybe I'd have been a millionaire by now, but like <laughs> I just invested so much time in mastering certain games, mm. and I always ended up having the same experience. It's like you, I would smash it, I'd do really well, and I'd like I'd get like top stats in that, and then it would just the meaninglessness of it would would always creep in. It's like what am I doing? Why am I playing this game? Like I've not gotten anything out of it. Like it's it it is pointless, and. It, it was, and because a lot of the games I used to play were just one player games. We didn't really have, like, internet wasn't a huge thing when, yeah, I, was, yeah. when I was growing up. And, mul like, our multiplayer games was getting Halo. We had a little tiny TV, and we used to sellotape a big piece of wood in the middle of the screen. And then two of us would and sit on one side, yeah, yeah. and two of us would sit on the other. And you weren't, so you couldn't screen watch. That was our multiplayer. Big, And then my mum would come in and, like, go mental, because we've got these huge pieces of wood sellotaped to the telly. But, um... Yeah, and like, but, but playing these one-player games, it like you'd smash it. You'd invest so much time, and you would be like on these epic adventures, and you're like battling dragons and killing things, and you know like you're collecting gold, and you become this master, and you're super rich, and you've got to the top, and then it's like, and then the story ends. Yeah, and, and then, then it's like, comes. oh, it, it it's not valuable at all. There is no value to what I've achieved in this. It's not transferable. I can't. Like maybe there's another kid out there that's going to be impressed by it, but who really cares? Mm. And and then I started making comparisons between that and life. It's like, oh wow, I'm like really good at Pizza Hut and serving pizzas. Oh wow, I'm you know I'm good at answering calls at customer service. And it's like, but so what? Like, what does that really matter? If and I was really into you know, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and all of these sort of like you know, the the pop science kind of guys dead into the Joe Rogan podcast and mm -hmm. all of that. And, you know, it was the same sort of thing that was constantly being reiterated. And they were, it were, they were trying to be sort of existentialists. They were trying to instill meaning through it, but they would all, it would always end up leading towards this sort of emptiness where it was like, you know, what's going on with the world? Like, why is it that these things happen? And um, and then if I ever got exposed to other things, like, you know, the severe suffering that happens in the world, I always felt like I was really undeserving mm. of anything that I had. Like, I didn't get, wh why is it that I have running water? Why do I have um, heating and safety and a mother who loves me? And, like, uh, why do I have these things? And there's, uh, you know, th other people in the world that maybe deserve it more than I do. And I, d I couldn't really feel like I ever deserved it. And I think that's one of the th reasons that I wanted to leave. But so there was this sense of meaninglessness. And then, but I, there was something like I wanted its meaning still. Like I, you know, so I'm traveling, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. But th the traveling just ended up being like another version of that. So I was jumping out of one bubble, which was Manchester, into loads of other bubbles. So like South Korea had their own bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I went to Taiwan and they had their own little bubble. And then Malaysia which is a Muslim country, and that was a, a little bubble. I ended up running a bar in Malaysia, mm. and um, I was there for like eight months. I lived on an island uh, on this beach, and I, like it was a really small island. Like You could walk from one end to the other in like 15 minutes, and it was just surrounded by jungle, and it was crazy. And I got it was a bit like a fairy tale. Like I'd, the, the heat of the sun would wake me up in the morning, and I'd stroll out like a proper beach bum, with my like my long hair that's been bleached gold by the sun, and I'd walk, and I, I only ever wore shorts, like they, that was it, just just shorts, and I'd wake up and I'd walk about in shorts, and I'd go to bed in shorts, and then it was just short, short, shorts, nothing else, and my like my routine was get up, jump in the ocean, swim with some fishes, get out, and uh, yeah, I could do what I want pretty much, but like even that started feeling like hell at one point because it was like on the surface it was paradise but there was lots of ugly things under the surface there was a lot of like a lot of the locals had drug problems people were on meth people were yeah. on heroin and so even when i found paradise hell would creep back in 
And it was like the suffering of life was present here in this paradise. People had died. Someone got murdered in the mountains. Someone got run over by a speedboat and got chopped up because of it. Um, the, the locals had all these drug problems and they were constantly fighting with tourists and it was just, you couldn't escape it. And then there was a couple of lads that were about my age. I had a lot of love for them. Like I used to chill with them quite a lot. And, uh, and then I found out they were like addicted to heroin and meth and they were like young lads and I didn't know at all. And then I, I, I found them in my toilets at my, at the bar that I worked and they're taking drugs wow. and they just acted like it was normal. Like it was cigarettes, you know, there weren't nothing wrong with it. Yeah. And it was like, and, I, and they, they couldn't really speak English. So I couldn't even communicate to them, like, why I find this thing in particular so apparent. Obviously, I've got a, a whole history with heroin with regards to my father. And that's, so I could never see it as normal like they yeah, did. Of course, yeah, of course. And, um, and it was just like that. And then there was this whole ego thing with travellers. It was like everyone's collecting their brownie points. Like, how long have you been travelling? How many countries have you been? Have you been off the beaten trail? Or whatever it's called, you know, beaten track. You know, if, did you travel ethically? Did you go to the tourist traps or not? You know yeah. how you know how extreme of a traveller were yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And like, obviously, towards the end of it, I was like eighteen months deep. I'd been, like, I'd worked in a bar. I'd gone here, there, and everywhere, and blah blah blah. blah. And uh, I could feel like, yeah, I was really getting a sense of how this thing was. As much as people like would engage in this to try to escape the ego or be egoless, like it was still a huge part yeah. of the whole culture of being a traveller. It was all very, very egotistical. So even that, even my attempts to try to escape it, just sort of ran me straight into it. Transfer, like it, yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. Just, just transformed into something yeah. else. But it was still there. It was still present. And um, it, it, yeah, the so what inauthenticity. Was, what was it, it was like when there. you came back? Depressing. Yeah. Because <laughs> like I was getting homesick. So I'd been away for like eighteen months. Mm. Um, towards the end, I'd been working in like a tiger temple. So I was looking after little baby tigers and that, and. Um, this was like a really weird, controversial place. It ended up in the news not long after I got back and got shut down because they were dead wow. dodgy, apparently. And um, it was very conflicting because it was a bit of a tourist trap, but it was a Buddhist temple. Mm -hmm. So it was like spiritual, but it wasn't really. It was super capitalist. And it was like, what on earth is going on here? And I, like, I didn't really want to go there to begin with, but then I had friends who'd been there and they convinced me, you've got to go like make your own mind up. So I was there I was in this place called Kanchanaburi. I was in Kanchan for maybe three months and I was in the temple for two months. And um, like getting, I, and I was like in charge of the tourists and people coming in and some people hated it. Some people would like cry when seeing these tigers in cages and things. And I could relate. It was, it's not nice, but that's another story. And, um, and some people loved it. Some people liked to take pictures of tigers and that and put them up as a profile picture. But even that was like feeling really pointless and, I was like, I need to go home. Like, I I need to go see my family. I miss my mum. I miss my brother. I miss my sister. So I didn't tell them, and I snuck back. <laughs> I got a flight, and then I was like knocking on the door and hiding around the corner. They had no idea I was coming back. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, boo, I'm home. And uh, and then yeah, that, that was nice. I got to see them, and then I, I got my old job back, and I was just expecting things to be like amazing. I just had these high expectations of what life was going to be like. And I felt like I'd changed so much because in a year and a half, I'd experienced more than I had done in my entire life, like by t maybe 10 times more. And it was just every day was something mad was going on. You know, this is crazy things were happening. And then I got back and it's like someone had pressed pause in Manchester mm -hmm. and waited for me to come back and then press play. And it was like every, everything, nothing had changed. Like everyone was doing the same things. Uh, it was like Groundhog Day. And um, and the excitement of my return uh, wasn't long lasting. Like people were buzzing. I was back and they were interested. And then like it got to a point where um, people, it, it started feeling like my stories were annoying them. And I could kind of see why it was like, I keep going on about this super exciting life of all of these mad things. Um, and they're just sort of like working, doing nine to five, doing things, like taking drugs on the weekend and drinking alcohol and uh, or they've got kids and they're stuck and you know th this kind of thing and it, it, it stopped being something people wanted to talk to me about mm. but then that was like that was me that was that, the only that thing, was your thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah yeah so I didn't really feel like I could talk to anyone because whenever I did I could sense they were getting sick of hearing about it 
So I had to just stop talking about it. And um, and then, but the, like at that point, it was like, I didn't know who I was. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I wasn't enjoying being around the people that I was usually around. Yeah. Um, I didn't enjoy the, doing the things that we used to do. I was starting to hate alcohol. I was starting to hate the whole drinking culture thing. And I started hating the conversations and the, the chasing women and all of that. Was just, it just like didn't offer anything for me anymore. And, um, and then I was really heavy on the weed at that point. And then I was like, and I started hating that as well. And then it was like, I hated everything at that point. There was like, life was just, just uh, rubbish. Yeah, painful. And uh, and so I left, I was living with my brother and his friends and I moved out and uh, and then I just isolated myself for a couple of years, basically. And um, it was not that long after I got back that I ended up, obviously, because I was sort of just sort of locked in a, an attic for most of the time on my own. I was doing a lot of reading. Um, I was looking into, I started reading the Quran again. I was looking, I was very into new age religion. So I was reading a lot about Hinduism and uh, a guy called Ram Das, uh, Eckhart Tolle, all these new age types. And um, yeah, I was just sort of like exploring religions again and trying to figure things out and reading different scriptures and trying to just figure out what on earth was going on and um, why I had this like weird, um, I, I read something later that put it pretty well. Thomas Nagel, he's an atheist philosopher. He, he talks about the absurd and what it what it is is this, you have this innate uh, need or urge for meaning as a human being. Like we just need meaning. And then you have this unreasonable silence in the world. Like it's it's like being born with thirst, but there's no water. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the existentialists refer to it as like the experience of the absurd. And like, I couldn't, it couldn't make heads or tail out of it. Like why on earth would we have these faculties for, you know, a desire and need for meaning if there is none? Mm. Like it, I just, it didn't, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, and um, so I was trying to find it. I was like, where, where is it? Where, where do you get this from? And like looking into Buddhism, looking into Christianity, looking into all of these other things, they weren't really doing anything. Whereas the more I was looking into Islam, the more boxes it was ticking. Mm -hmm. And um, I think at the time I was like watching the YouTube videos and I'm pretty sure I came across the EF Dawa videos and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. And I was listening to what they were saying and I was reading about the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and about the life of the Sahaba and I was seeing the suffering they were going through and I could really relate to the things they were going through. Obviously they, what they had to deal with was much worse than what I ever dealt with. But like I, I found it really easy to try to put myself in their shoes when they were going through you know the period in Mecca, when people were like, like to stop talking, don't, you don't stop trying to spread this message or that message or blah blah blah, and the the suffering and the pain that they went through, I I could feel it reading about them, and um, yeah, it was like I could sense sincerity in the stories of these people, and I could sense. Um, that you know there was something a lot more to this and it, like why would they have all have been so committed to this despite everything that they were going through um and th and there was no victory in sight for like more than a, i hope for a decade and but yet they committed and they and you could sense that they were having this thirst satisfied yeah and that was like amazing for me i was like subhanallah well obviously i didn't say subhanallah at the time yeah, I was yeah. But um, that was what drew me to it. And so I, I was really looking into it and I was thinking about Tawheed. And at this point, I was becoming a lot more inclined to the belief in a God and a deity. Because you're looking at the world, like obviously when I was traveling as well, especially you've seen seeing things like tigers, seeing things that just constantly instill awe in you. Uh, when I ran the bar in Malaysia, um, it was a Muslim island. So they used to play the Adhan wow. in the morning when we'd been degenerates all night, mm. um, messing about, getting drunk and acting like fools. We were, we were looking like Muppets, sat on the grass somewhere or on the beach. And then the Adhan would play. And as we're getting ready to go to bed, all the Muslims were getting up for prayer, looking bright eyed and bushy tailed. Yeah. <laughs> and we looked like absolute messes. And uh, like we'd just been dragged through the jungle. <laughs> so it's stupid. 
and like and the Adhan, I whenever I heard it, it, it always had a huge impact on me. Yeah. Like it, it, and the first time I'd ever heard it was when I was about seventeen, eighteen. I went on a lads' holiday in Turkey. Right. Same sort of thing. I was like, I'd been out on a night out. We'd been getting drunk. We'd been messing about all night. My mates are acting like muppets, getting into fights, chasing women. And then, like, at the end of the night, I'm just sick of it. And I remember looking at the stars and then just being in awe at how small I was. Yeah. And then, like, and but, like, I can't explain it other than just as a severe sense of awe, looking at the universe, looking at creation, and just being amazed by it. And then relating myself to it like what am i like how am what 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 is this what's going on and then comparing and then like turning around and going from feeling like i was really small and then looking at ants and ants were moving about on the floor underneath me and then all of a sudden i feel really big yeah and like trying to figure that out like how one minute i feel really small next minute i feel really big and then i'm looking at these little things and it's like do they suffer from depression? Like, do they suffer from existential crisis? Like, this ant's just doing what it needs to do. It's busting about. Like, why am I going through these type of things? And I don't see that happening with these little dudes here. They're just, like, engaged. It's like everything in the universe is doing its job and it's in its place and you, we're I'm the not, odd one out. I'm yeah. out of sync. Exactly and I out of sync. Yeah, yeah. That's the, yeah, yeah. And I couldn't make sense of it. And and subhanAllah, bro, there was someone who gave me their iPod or something. I was listening to Hallelujah. Right. Hallelujah. And then uh, the Adhan hit. And that was the first time I'd ever heard the Adhan. Mm. And uh, I remember not understanding what on earth it was talking about, but like it really reigned in that sense of awe. Like I remember hearing it. And it, it was, there was a huge impact it had on me. And then that was when I was like 18. Obviously, many years later, I'm now in Malaysia. Same thing. You've got the Adhan playing at the end of the night after just spending a day of being degenerates. And um, I, don't, <laughs> I shouldn't use that word, but you know what I mean? It has, uh, the Adhan has a, a spiritual effect. Yeah. And I, and I, I didn't know what it was yeah. saying. I knew it was like the call to prayer. It was as vague as that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, obviously, they're not just saying call to prayer, call to prayer, call to prayer, call to yeah. prayer, call to prayer. Like, there's other things being said in it, and um, but like, I just, I just wanted to be silent. I just wanted to listen to it. I didn't want to do anything else, and um, I had that experience so often on that. I was on that island for like months, and so it was very, very often I would hear the Adhan. Mm. and um, yeah, and so like, just like linking these experiences, reading the Quran, and the Quran itself was like it would make me serious it would make me think seriously and take yeah. life seriously for a minute and ask proper questions really? and reflecting on it and it was speak and, it, and not just that it was like when i was reading it and i was thinking about like the sharia and the laws and the things that it's telling me not to do like i knew why i shouldn't do these things yeah like i saw the wisdom in it yeah. like i knew i shouldn't be drinking alcohol mm. i knew i shouldn't really be taking drugs i knew that swearing too often or that like chasing women and like you know the, this the, all of this these behaviors that i was engaged in and, and then watching people around me doing the same thing i knew it was wrong and i could see why it was wrong for them mm. as well i could see why like our society in general is suffering because of a lot of these issues and just thinking you know if imagine if everyone believed this and implemented it how that would change them and how that would change society and how many things would be removed. But by no means, like, necessarily become a utopia. Obviously, that it's always going to be a difficult thing to try to establish, but, like, I could see how many issues would be taken away. And it would always speak to you on a very fundamental level. And, like, it was talking to that bit that I would try to hide even from myself and from everyone. And then that thought about Allah was always, like, you know, Allah is that which you just can't hide anything from. There's there's something out there mm. that no matter who I try to make myself seem to be in front of others, because I was very egocentric. I was very concerned about what people thought of me or how. Yeah, yeah. And um, I wanted to be the cool guy. I wanted to be X, Y, Z. And what happened was, is it felt like I just what was me dissolved. Like I was empty, and I was like. Is maybe a, a point where I was sort of really, really taking it seriously. Like, who am I? And like I, before then, it was like I was the traveler. I was 
the this, I was the that. I you know, I could do fire poi and spin things round. I was the guy who worked in a tiger temple. I was like and those were the things I thought I were. And then eventually I got sick of it. And so I was throwing all of these things away, uh, metaphorically. And then all that was left was, quote unquote, nothing, but just me and God, like pretty much the only way I can explain it. And that he, no matter how much I try to hide, no matter who I try to be in front of other people, that like I can't hide anything from him, from the one who made me. And that there's a part of me, as much as I try to keep it secret, it, like he has access to it. Mm. And that would force this like... um I don't know how to explain it, maybe like a severe authenticity in me. Like I, I became, when I was alone and it was just me and this being that could see everything about you that you can't hide anything from, I'd become sincere for a moment. It's a better way of putting it. Yeah. Weird. Yeah, alhamdulillah. That's, all, that's what you needed to go through to get where you are now. Mm. So um, from then, how, how, how long was it until you took your shahada and took the steps to become a Muslim? What, were you, what was going through your mind when you first thought, I, I need Islam's actually true, I need to do this? Yeah, yeah. well, I was, like I say, looking into many things mm. at that point. Um, and the Quran was part of that. And there was loads of other things being mixed up into it. So there was the New Age religion stuff, there was Hinduism, there was this, that, and the other. And it was very left-wing as well. So that there was like this very political skew. And um, I was just like trying to be as sincere as I possibly could. And so I think at one point I was just like praying, like whoever it is that's in charge for this, like I turn to you, like guide me, help me. And uh, so I made like a little dua. Obviously it wasn't explicit because I was sort of on my own. I didn't have at this point anyone around me, mainly because I was sort of isolating myself. I was cutting everyone off. Mm -hmm. Whatever ties I had, I was removing them. And uh, I was avoiding as much contact as I could. And um, it wasn't too long after that I eventually was reading more and more Quran, looking more and more into the life of the Prophet and Salah and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And eventually it was just like, like I believed in God. Mm -hmm. I believe God was one. I believe Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a prophet. I believe the Quran was the word of God. And the only thing that was stopping me again was this worry of what other people might think of me. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I, I just had to shout at myself at one point. It's like, well, if you believe in all of these things, why do you care what, anyone's gonna say like what's that gonna matter when you're dead <laughs> like really are, are you gonna be like oh well you know they were gonna call me names and uh, you know you're just gonna look like a muppet like be sincere be authentic if you believe in it and commit to it so i took my shahada and then things sort of developed slowly from there it was a very long process but i didn't become super muslim overnight yeah but, yeah you know it was uh the beginning of that i remember journey. i remember you telling me a while ago that um you kept it secret for a few years, didn't you? Yeah, I didn't tell no one. <clears throat> there was a couple well. of Muslim friends that I mentioned it to, uh, but other than that, I didn't tell no one. When some of my friends found out, I was like, no, I'm just like, I just want to learn a bit about what Islam is, man. Yeah, it's sort of ashamed. Yeah, yeah, no, I was like, I'm not really like, uh, I'm just kind of, um, you know, I just wanted to learn more about it and stuff. And yeah. I just couldn't say to them, no, no, I believe it. Because yeah, I knew yeah. it would bring on argument stuff. I just couldn't deal with that. So, yeah, yeah, same same thing. Yeah, and yeah. I knew as well. So, like I like I say, I came from a very council estate background. Yeah. Um, and you get and bullied. It, was, well, it wasn't bullied. It's like, different. It was just I knew what kind of conversations were going to be had because I was a, I was around these people and I could hear what they would say about Islam. I could hear what they would say about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I heard what they thought about the religion. Yeah. And obviously I I just didn't agree with a lot of what they said, but I could hear it. And they didn't know that I was Muslim. And so they would just speak openly. So you have this sort of like camouflage cloak. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you're, you're sort of the mole behind enemy lines. You still so have speak. it now, Moreau. A lot of yeah, people yeah. don't think, I don't know about you, I, a lot of people don't think I'm Muslim when they meet yeah, me. No, yeah, yeah, work dues or whatever. And then people were like, uh, like I remember um, so, oh, you, you were a hipster you, you just make coffee don't you <laughs> I don't know. The, one guy was talking about his beard and he was like yeah and uh, I had it once I had it really long and they used to call me like <laughs> they used to call me the jihadi guy or, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that and he was taking the mick out of Muslims and I was like 
I didn't spring it up because it would bring yeah, it'd be awkward. It'd be awkward for him and stuff. Because yeah. I don't think he meant it in maliciously. Yeah, yeah. But it's look, you get loads of that. You and get, you get that sinking feeling in your stomach. Yeah, because like, it's um, like oh, they don't know. Yeah, <laughs> they don't know. They don't know. Yeah, it's true. It's a lot. And that happened a lot. And um, yeah. and so there's there are people in my family that will just say they're not fond of Islam at all, and they're very actively against it. Mm. And I'd hear all of the things they would say, and I knew that it's going to be so awkward when they find out that I'm a Muslim. So when did you come out? How did it happen? So it was like maybe two years later. Yeah. And uh, I was like, I've just got to tell my mum. I think I told my sister before, and my sister's really uh, supportive. May Allah bless her and guide her. Mm. And um, but yeah, she was always really nice about it and dead understanding. I told my brother he didn't care. Mm. Just a lad's lad. Oh, it's all a bunch of crap anyway, and uh, and uh, I may look at him too I, uh, yeah, because I've got a really really good bond with my brother, my sister, and my mum. We're really close um, as a family. Alhamdulillah. And then I was like, now I've got to tell my mum, <laughs> and that was like so hard because I knew that she's gonna be afraid or like she's gonna be scared about what that meant. Mm. And so I remember I was like, you just got to tell her, you got to tell her, you got to tell her. So I was like, right, she's coming over, she's coming over. You're going to tell her today, you're going to tell her today. And I, I had to like do it. I think I probably chickened out a few times. And then like I was nearly going to tell her, but that feeling of panic, of fear, of like my heart was, it felt constricted just like trying to explain to her or even thinking about explaining to her. And then one day I was just like, you've just got to do it now. So she was sat down and I was like, mom, I've got to tell you. I felt like I was coming out, you know, like, <laughs> in, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the closet, closet Muslim. Yeah. And so I sat down, I was like, mom, I've got something to tell you. And the second I said it, I saw her face drop. So I, I feel she was already scared of what I was going to say. I hadn't even said it yet. And like my heart just felt, yeah, not good. And then what did she act when you said it? Uh, it was like, I'm, I'm Muslim now. I'm so yeah, I said it. And then her face drops more and she's like, oh, you're not going to go over there, are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Alhamdulillah, I, my family were quite, they're so liberal. It was like, yeah, man, do what you want as long as you don't hurt anyone. Yeah, and it was, they were cool with it. My mum's a bit liberal as well, but yeah. it's like we've got, we'll just say very right-wing connections within the family as yeah, well. So yeah. like there's always that sort of element there and she hears a lot about, all of the bad things happening over there so her fear was just that i was going to go run away and join you know the you know who mm. and um it was like no 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 mom, that's that's not that. that's, yeah i'm just not yeah. you don't have to worry about that you have the thing of being a muslim for two years without no it's like have i changed in the last two years what have you seen well the only well, the thing is is that i was really ninja yeah so at, at this point I, like i say i was on my own so I, I wasn't really i didn't have a sheikh or anyone teaching me oh uh, yeah i didn't yeah. know how to pray i didn't know what was obligatory, what wasn't. All I knew was that I believed in God and I believed in the Quran, I believed in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and I believed that I shouldn't eat haram food. Mm. And so rather than having to deal with telling everyone, no, no, I can't eat that, is that halal or not? I just became vegetarian. Yeah, yeah. And then I didn't have to, I was like, no, 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 is that meat? I can't eat it. I'm a vegetarian. Yeah, it's easier, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So to be honest, it's good advice for someone in that situation where they can't tell anyone yet. Uh, it's well socially acceptable to eat. I'm doing veganary. Yeah, oh, I like that. I'm going to do that now. Yeah, I'll just be yeah. a vegetarian, like, because you can still drink your milk and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. get your eggs in you and that and all of that stuff. But it just saves that awkwardness, especially if you, if you for whatever reason, you need to put it off. It, ideally, it's good if you can just jump straight in the deep end, but I know that how hard that is. So I'm not going to say that everyone's going to do that. And for those who really don't feel like they can, vegetarian's the next best thing. Mm. And, um, so yeah, it was that. And then like, I just obviously wasn't drinking alcohol and I wasn't really going out or doing anything anyway. So I was just sort of in my house all the time. And, um, yeah, and I guess I jumped from one extreme to the other and I was in my house for too long. And then it got, I think it was like my first Ramadan and I was really scared about having to fast. Yeah. Yeah. And I knew I'd found out somewhere. I can't remember where I'd heard that, um, you don't have to fast if you're traveling. So I was like, I have an idea. I'm gonna walk to Glasgow because <laughs> if I'm if I'm walking long distances, yeah, yeah. 
and, and not just that like I'd only just become Muslim and I was hearing a lot about um, you know the things that the Syrians you know make things easy for them what, mm -hmm. all the crap they were going through and then it, it was all over the news about them walking across Europe mm. and I was like that's far like to go walk from Syria to England that's a huge distance and then I was talking to people I was like you know and whenever I mentioned it it's like nah you can't do that no one can do that blah 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 and then I was like, I might walk to Glasgow. And they were like, no, you're mad. And everyone would make it sound like it's weird. I was like, hold on a sec. It wasn't that long ago that that's what people had to do. Like, if you've got family in Glasgow yeah. and you've, got, you've not got a horse, you're walking to Glasgow. Yeah. I was like, why is that weird? And the it's fact that I wanted to do it, they kept making it. And I, I, I was getting sick of being made to feel weird. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. Forget this. And, uh, and I like the idea of not having my phone or like, no internet you're doing, you're doing the mini hijra again aren't you a little travel to escape yeah, 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 yeah. yeah exactly that and like and i knew that i wouldn't have to worry about trying to figure out how to fast and all of that mm. and so and i had a little dog at the time called sausage and uh he had a little backpack i had my little backpack i had my tent i had a cooker i had everything and then i just started walking north yeah. and headed through the lakes and through you know xyz and yeah. trying to find somewhere to camp in the evening and then setting off walking in the day and doing that every day it took me about 19 days and um i think i got just past moffat a summer and then my mm. cousin picked me up not too far away from him it was about 190 miles I ended up walking in total so what crazy like that i'll tell you what mate we've had a really in-depth uh view of of your journey from from when you were younger to really in depth with the traveling and what was going on in your mind and and this like f uncovering the reality of your belief at that time which is like if if there's no god there's nothingness so there must be a god and you found that um but unfortunately we're gonna have to wrap it up bro we might have to have part two maybe uh, that'd be cool da -da -da -da. inshallah but yeah it's been lovely having you man uh, before we end it have you got any advice for um people who are thinking about becoming muslim but are kind of worried about like family and things like that a bit like you you went through yeah like or even the ones that have taken child but they haven't called anyone yet it's just the biggest thing is, is sabr patience just you know if you believe you believe commit to it like i think that the, the thing that would annoy me is um when i would hear about people that would just give it up because of these things mm. despite the fact they believe in one god they believe muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a prophet and they would let these social pressures win mm. in the end um that was something i always found infuriating and so i would just say just don't don't do that don't give up yeah <laughs> yeah don't just be patient and like if you're not comfortable telling anyone you don't have to you know that even the, the sahaba when they felt threatened you know they concealed their faith mm. and there was a period and they didn't become super muslim overnight and this is one of the biggest problems is everyone's like no 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 i, I want to be you know a, i want to yeah i want to be this pure yeah. thing you know like an angel before i take my shahada and it's, it's it's the worst approach ever because no one is an angel especially today it's near impossible and if you wait until you become angelic you're never gonna become muslim at all and it just seems strange to put it off, especially if you already believe in God, if you already believe the, all of the principles mm. of faith. And it it just becomes a case of like, you, you know, acknowledging the fact that you are doing it for other reasons. You're, you're refusing to do it because there's a number of commitments. But it's better to be a believer who isn't perfect yeah. than someone who refuses to become a believer. Bury their head in the sand. Yeah, yeah, yeah until they become perfect. Mm. And it's just, yeah. And it, the whole taking the shahada is part of the process of becoming a better Muslim in the first place. Like you start at the bottom. Like the Quran was revealed over 20 odd years. And, it's, and it says, you know, if we'd have revealed it to them all in one go, they'd have ran away from you. And, you know, they were fed it slowly. So, and they progressed slowly. And they, their character was developed slowly mm -hmm. and we should you know, you know what are we better than the sahaba exactly you know, like, and the prophet peace upon him taught the um the companions to when they when islam when someone accepted islam um to teach them slowly yeah. salah for uh, shahada first salah and it was teaching the five pillars and it wasn't teach them all at once and they got the, it was once they've learned how to pray then we move on to fasting yeah. and once they've done the fasting Remember, it, and he's talking about Ramadan as well. Yeah. Uh, it's not just uh, fasting, you know, other times. 
so you've got to wait for Ramadan to come and then you've got another whole year and, yeah. you know and then what's next it's Hajj it, it it was it it's the it's the sunnah to to um to teach a new Muslim slowly and expect them yeah, to do yeah. it slowly as well. And it's weird this thing of like you're you're but you're Muslim. Why yeah, have you got yeah. a dog? Why have you done this? Yeah, Why yeah, have you got that? But this this leads into the next <laughs> thing. So you've got to be patient with yourself. Not expect perfection from yourself instantly. It, it is a work in progress. And so long as you know, you know what is right and wrong and like if if you're doing things and you can't you're finding it hard to stop them if you know it's wrong and in your heart you're letting yourself hate it like for example i was big on weed that was something huge for me like it was a daily part of my life i'd smoke it the second i woke up all the way through to going to bed that was very difficult for me to give up but i would let myself hate it mm. despite being addicted to it yeah and it was that allowing myself to hate that part of me or that habit um, that led to me being able to give it up in the end, and you, and yeah, it's just you've got to be patient with yourself, and also be patient with the Muslims. Like one thing, uh, some of the Muslims can be a bit awkward, <laughs> and they they're not they're not too sure about how much they're supposed to try to get you to do. Maybe some of them are a bit more pushy than others, and the worst thing you can do is let yourself get really angry about it because they're going to pop up. They always are. And some people, they get so furious about it, they sort of push themselves away from the Muslim community yeah, completely. Yeah, and that's the worst thing you can do. Because yeah. then you're isolated. And it's just be patient with them. When someone's being a bit pushy, just allow it. Like, just, yeah, no problem, no problem. You don't have to spend time with them. Mm. You, and you can work out who's good to be around and who's not. You know, you don't have to, like be BFFs with everyone simply because they're Muslim. Yeah. Like you can still pick your friends. You can still pick the people you want to spend time with and those who you don't. And if there's some people that you just feel like are maybe a little bit too toxic or, you know, they're really sort of making you feel way too much pressure, then if you've got the courage to just say, just please, like, calm down a little bit. You're making me feel anxious or whatever. You say to them. And if you're not comfortable with doing that, then just... You know, stay around people who are a bit more because yeah. like, I, I have, alhamdulillah, I have some really good friends, and they were really patient with me. And like, there, there are these awkward moments where, like, you've got these bad habits. Like, I used to swear a lot, and there were some brothers that would be really patient with me and say, yeah, you, you yeah. "Try not to swear," but they wouldn't make a big deal yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. They wouldn't make me feel like an idiot. They wouldn't shame me or you know, blah 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 blah. Well, they they just get... understood where I came from. Yeah, that that was quite normal. Yeah, and so they would be patient. With me. And alhamdulillah, like now I, it's not an issue. Like I don't alhamdulillah deal with these things. So you 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 need to be patient with yourself. You need to be patient with the Muslims. Sometimes you're going to come across someone who's a bit pushy, but just understand. You know they they have their own background. You know, so some of them just haven't ever dealt with non-Muslims before mm. and so they're really awkward around people yeah, awkward from an or excited background. or yeah, 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 yeah. you know you want to share something so yeah you have you that spectrum so just be patient and you'll meet okay. people that you wouldn't ever meet before because you wouldn't have bothered because you wouldn't have got on but what yeah, brings yeah. you together is islam, islam yeah. so that meet that it kind of forces you to meet people all different walks of life yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah so so you're going to experience now having some spending time with people that you wouldn't normally spend time with and then you're going to find those people that you click with and you're going to find people that you're you, you know you're cordial with cordial is that the word yeah there you go. anyway you gel bro. with anyway yeah gel with that's the one yeah. anyway bro um one more thing before we end we talked a lot about sad things of of the life before islam what about being muslim now makes you happy alhamdulillah the prayer yeah yeah praying and brothers the muslims i have a lot of good muslim friends now and uh, there's a, a strange thing. Even Muslim brothers I hadn't really experienced much. Um, is his name Isa, the brother that passed away? Yeah, yeah, Isa. Isa. I'd, I'd never spoke to him in my life, and um, I I saw him on Jordan's channel a couple of times. When I found that he passed away, that hurt me so much. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. really weird. And I had this like severe sense of. Um, Love for him, like I, I don't know how else to describe it. And he, he probably, I don't think he'd ever spoken to me ever. Like, he might not have even known I existed. And um, like that, I feel it with a lot of people now, uh, just simply because we uh, we both love the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because we both believe and yeah. worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That is what unites us, and that I, like is unparalleled. Another thing, in the non-Muslim days, we all used to fight about um, who owed who money. Oh, you paid for the bill last time. 
like, like, no, I paid for the bill last time. You've got to pay for it this time. Oh, yeah, I yeah. saved you half a cigarette. You've got to give me that back. <laughs> you know, like, everyone yeah. would write down everything and hold everyone to it and get yeah. really upset. With the Muslims, it was a it's complete opposite. opposite. It was like you have to beg to let them give you the opportunity to pay. I got. I had to when I just the guilt of it. Like when you become when you become Muslim, you just feel so guilty. Everyone's giving you stuff, and you're like, "Please, and just yeah, let me pay." Yeah, and then like, and no, that's no. really weird. And then you get this, and then I got to a point where I was like, "Well, that's just it. They just want to give me stuff." And then and then I'm like, "Yeah." I'll have it. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> because I know what it's what. And then, but then I think, oh God, I'm taking all. Wait a minute. Wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's, it's not to get our balanced. culture, is it? No, no, no. Uh, it's yeah. so weird. And yeah. like even before I was Muslim, that was a huge thing. Yeah. Like I, they're always arguing over who gets to pay, and I'm like, this isn't what like I'm used to at all. Yes. Yeah, this is really weird. And they're like no, doing no. it for the sake of yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see it's not like an ego thing. Like they really yeah. want that reward. Yeah. <laughs> like they're, they're, they want to pay, and then it's like. Yeah, they're competing for good. Alhamdulillah for Islam Alhamdulillah. And, the, and the Ummah. Alhamdulillah. All right, so salamu alaykum, bro. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. I'll see you soon. Inshallah. Right. Salamu alaykum. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the show. Now, if you want to learn a bit more about Islam, uh, we've got this new WhatsApp number. It's on the screen now. So you can uh, message us on WhatsApp. Any questions, we'll have someone there to reply, answer those questions for you. Okay, so if you're a Muslim and you want to give dawah, um, we do a free online dawah training course. We also do a new Muslim mentoring course. So the the link should be in the description below. Um, if you're a new Muslim and you want a bit of support learning your deen, how to pray, what the uh, foundations of belief, we've got a new Muslim course. It's really good. I've done it myself, actually. It's really, really good. And it sets a good foundation for your journey as a Muslim. Uh, the link is on the, the screen right now. It's also in the description. Assalamu alaikum.